Okay, this is our last um, time on the Easter supposed, alleged contradictions. Um, and we're going to focus on specifically three that have to do with the resurrection and the ascension. Now, these are actually ones that I thought, um, as I was just looking through the list of all the ones that had been asserted, these really jumped out at me, and I thought, wow, that, that actually seems kind of, I don't know, that one actually looks like it might be a contradiction. You know, the, most of the ones we've looked at have been silly, right? Some of them have been like, well, let's look a little closer, right? But these kind of jumped out at me at first and look like, oh, th these might actually look like problems. And so um, I saved them for last, and then upon further reflection and looking into it, I was wrong. So we'll uh, look at why it is that they are not very good. So the first one is about the women, right? Or the first two are about the women discovering the tomb and, and, and what it is that they were told and what the disciples did. So this first one, um, what were the women supposed to tell the disciples? Right, because remember, they show up, and there's an angel or angels there, and they tell the women something. Well, supposedly, according to Bart Ehrman, right, this is where we've gotten many of the contradictions we've been looking at. He says this one is a contradiction. It is a difference in the stories of the gospel. So let's just hear him and what he has to say. What were they told to tell the disciples? Were the disciples supposed to stay in Jerusalem to see Jesus, or were they supposed to go to Galilee? Depends which gospel you read. Hmm, so were they supposed to stay in Jerusalem, or were they supposed to go to Galilee? Now, I looked around to find where this is supposedly being talked to. Now, you have a little table there um, with the verses that this is the challenge. Here are the verses that they're going to say, this is a contradiction. Matthew 28, 7, the angel says, Go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee, and there you will see him. And behold, I have told you. And Mark says much the same thing. The angel says, Go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee, and there you will see him as he said to you. So there the angels are telling the women, Hey, go and tell them to go meet Jesus in Galilee. But then Luke 24, 49 says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. So, so he, here's the claim. Okay, Matthew and Mark, they say, go to Galilee. But Luke says, stay in Jerusalem. But when you stop and think about it, do, it meant two different times. That is actually where this kind of gets unpacked. Um, this are the, these, and you should have this little table in there also. In this one, in Luke twenty four forty nine, that's not the angel talking to the women. This gets set up as a contradiction. And it's not even the same event. This is Jesus at the ascension telling his disciples to stay in Jerusalem waiting for Pentecost. This is not even the same event. But people will point out and say it's a contradiction. Here's the actual verses. If you look at what is said, you actually get, um, you know, Matthew says go to Galilee. Mark says go to Galilee. Luke doesn't say anything. The angel doesn't give any kind of instructions on where they're supposed to go or what they're supposed to do. It just says he's risen. John, the same thing. All the angel says to the, says is recorded is he's saying to Mary, why are you weeping? There's no instructions there to tell the disciples to go somewhere or do anything. There's no contradiction. The verses that, and I, and I looked into this because I was like, well, that can't be it. And I searched several different websites and places where um, this uh, accusation is made. 
and they all pointed to the Luke passage that wasn't even the angel talking. It was Jesus at the ascension. Not a contradiction. And right here we have, side by side, these are the passages, and you have them right there on your sheet. These are the passages where the angels give instructions, give a message to the women. You can see for yourself, there is nothing contradictory. Nothing. And yet, a top-rated Bible scholar, Bart Ehrman, is going to say, there's a contradiction. Did they do this or did they do that? It depends on which gospel you read. No. There's no contradiction. He should know better. You can look there for yourself. The next one. This one isn't so much about what the women were told. It's about what the disciples actually did. Did the disciples stay in Jerusalem or do they actually go to Galilee? Did the disciples ever leave Jerusalem? Or did they immediately, did they never leave? Or did they uh, leave and go to Galilee? Depends which gospel you read. Luke chapter 24, verse 49 to 52. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. This is Jesus talking. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven, and they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. So Luke is just recording that they were in Jerusalem. He was talking to them in Jerusalem, visited and appeared to them in Jerusalem, and then he ascended to heaven and they went back to Jerusalem. Acts chapter 1, verse 4, also written by Luke says, being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. So Luke and Acts, hey, here's the part, it's kind of implied though. Luke and Acts make no mention at all of the disciples going to Galilee. Don't mention it. Everything that Luke records whether it's at the end of his gospel or the beginning of Acts, everything that Luke records has them in Jerusalem. He doesn't mention any trips to Galilee. Matthew 28, 16, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. Mark does not say where the appearances happened. However, back in verse six, uh, chapter 16, verse 7, they're told to go to Galilee, so you can kind of assume... That's what they did, even though it's not specifically mentioned. John 21, verse 1 says, After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, which is another name for the Sea of Galilee. Okay, so according to Matthew and John, and reasonably Mark too, they went to Galilee. But Luke says they didn't. Does Luke really say they didn't? Is that what Luke says? They have no mention of the appearances in Galilee. Does that mean they never went to Galilee? No. Just because he do not mention it doesn't mean it doesn't happen. The other three Gospels actually mention it. That's a pretty good indication that it happened. And for whatever reason, Luke doesn't mention it. We've talked before about how uh, the ending of Luke kind of seems abbreviated. I mean, he's giving a ton of detail. And then the last couple chapters just seem really rushed. And he just like crams a bunch of stuff in. Maybe he's running out of space. Maybe he's running out of time. I mean, I don't know. But just because he doesn't mention it doesn't mean it didn't happen. The other three Gospels tell us it did. There's no contradiction there. And again, this is one of those things where um, it, it's an oddity that these kind of things... All of the ones that we have dealt with through this series are things that um, high-ranking, you know, high top, high, high, you know, credible, prestigious Bible scholars who are, you know, atheist, you know, skeptical Bible scholars will point out and go, "Aha! Contradiction in the Bible." And people continue to just lap it up, despite the fact that it is easily shown to be wrong 
but these guys don't lose their credibility. I mean, we have looked at, I think this is 22, 23 different contradictions, and 12 of them, I believe, were from Bart Ehrman. How many times does he have to get something wrong before you start going, no, wait a minute, maybe I shouldn't listen to this guy. But does he lose credibility among skeptics? No, he does not. Whereas, you know, if you had a preacher, if you had a Christian guy you know, who got, made some mistakes, every mistake they made is going to be a discrediting offense in the eyes of non-believers. You can kind of see a little double standard going on. Um, no, he, he is... Um, he grew up, he, he was raised in church, he grew up evangelical. I think he actually, um, I don't know if he was studying to be a minister, but he went to Bible college. You know, I mean, he, he was studying the Bible, and then he had a teacher that pointed out... Um, uh, a, a, an issue, an error, a discrepancy, a difference or something. And, and that just kind of sent him down a spiral of, oh no, these things are wrong. And I, I believe the one that got him was actually one of the ones we've already looked at and saw that it was nothing. But he would call himself an agnostic. Um, but he's written several books specifically against and opposing the Bible. What's interesting is he'll say things that lead you, like imply, well, you can't trust the Bible. Oh, well, we don't know if it was written. Right? He'll compare it to the telephone game. Right? We all know that game where you whisper something to the next person and it goes around the, down the line, around the circle, and by the time it gets to the end, it's nothing like the beginning. I've actually seen him in debates refer to the transmission of the Bible, copying of the Bible to the telephone game. He knows better. This is exactly his field of study. He knows that's not true. And, and I've seen him in interviews in different places where you kind of get him cornered and he admits, yeah, the Bible we have now is pretty much what was written down originally. Well, he knows it. For some reason, I don't know if it is just his eyes are blinded, uh, if he's got some kind of emotional, personal beef or, or, or just whatever. It sells books. I mean, I don't want to accuse people of that, with, you know, but... but I, I don't know. It's just, I'm trying to remember what it was because he, he did, he actually studied with a guy named Bruce Metzger, who was one of the top um, Bible scholars of the last century. And they uh, co-authored a book together, or, or, or at least or he worked on like an, an updated edition of it or whatever. Well, he did that book and the very same year he released a popular book Right? This one was a scholarly book that, you know, academic people buy. You know, it costs like $200 kind of thing. One of those kind of books. But then in the popular book that gets sold in bookstores that the average person is buying, he contradicted. So in this book, he says one thing. In the popular book, he says another. I, I don't want to assign motives or, you know, say bad things. I just let the facts stand for, for themselves that the claims he makes against the Bible do not stand, as we have seen However, I got to tell you, I've been wrestling with this one for weeks. What day did Jesus die on? That's a simple question. And luckily, we're told in both Mark and John. In Mark's gospel, we're told that Jesus died the day after the Passover meal was eaten in Jerusalem. John tells us explicitly, chapter 19, verse 14, that Jesus died the day before the Passover meal was eaten, on the day of preparation for the Passover. That's different. He couldn't die both days. Hmm. Well, let's take a look. Okay. John 19, he points out, okay, this is John, that this is Pilate sentencing Jesus. Hey, this is Pilate, Jesus on trial. Pilate has tried to say, hey guys, he's innocent, but you know, no one's having it. He's had him whipped. He's given away Barabbas. But finally enough is enough. And in John 19, Pilate says, it says, now it was the preparation day of the Passover about the sixth hour. And he, Pilate, said to the Jews, behold your king. And then he sends him off to get crucified. Okay, it was the preparation day of the Passover. 
That means before the Passover. Okay? So the way John would kind of seem to be lining things out is that you have the Last Supper. He's arrested at night. You have the trials and the crucifixion on the day of preparation of the Passover. And then is when people are eating the Passover meal. Right, tradition tells us that Jesus was crucified at the same time that they sacrificed the Passover lamb. Okay, so, so this would seem to be seem to be the timeline of what John is giving us. But wait a minute. In Mark, okay, this is um, the day before his arrest. Right, and this is um, the, yeah, the evening before his arrest. It says, now on the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover lamb, the disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and prepare that you may eat the Passover? And he sent out two of his, I, I think I may have cut some of this middle stuff out. Um, and he sent out two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him and wherever he goes, say to the master of the house. The teacher says, where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And then he will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared, and there make ready for us. Verse 16. And so his disciples went out and came to the city and found it just as he had said to them, and they prepared the Passover. In the evening he came with the twelve, and now they sat and ate, and Jesus said, and then it goes on to other things. Okay, well, the timeline of Mark seems to indicate that they're preparing for the Passover. They eat the Passover meal then he's arrested, has his trials, and gets crucified. So which is it? Before or after the Passover meal? That's a tough one. This is one that, and, 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 and as I was looking through it, about every time I, got, I thought I had it nailed down, I'm like, okay, here's what it is. I'd read something else and go, oh, maybe that's not what it is. What is the answer to this conundrum, right? Well, what are we going to do with this? Okay. What's that? Somebody had an early Passover meal. That is actually one of the, um, there, there are several popular ideas about how to do this. One of them is it was an early Passover meal. Uh, that, that because he knew that he wasn't going to be around for the formal, official Passover meal. They did it the day before. So he could have the Passover meal with his disciples. Well, you know, maybe. But there's some other things that that kind of goes, well, I don't know. What about this? What about that? Um, some people say that um, the, the, the day of preparation wasn't actually the day of preparation for the Passover that the day of preparation was actually preparation for the regular Sabbath. It just happened to be during Passover. So it wasn't the day of preparation for Passover. It was the day of preparation for a regular Saturday. It just happened to fall, you know, within Passover season, right? There's all kinds of different things people have uh, tried to put forward. And as I would look at them, I'd see one, I'd go, huh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And then I'd read something else and go, well, maybe it doesn't quite make as much sense as I thought. Let me ask you this. When is Passover? Do you even know? Right, the, the Bible actually tells us quite a few things. Um, in Exodus 12, um, it goes into, uh, it's actually quite long. Most of the chapter is taken up by um, Passover and feast kind of stuff. But in Exodus 12, it says, Now you shall keep it until the, the it, the it here is referring to the lamb. Previously, it said you get a lamb that's unspotted. On the 10th day of the month, you get a lamb that's unspotted. And you keep it until the 14th day of the same month. And then the whole assembly, the congregation of Israel, shall kill it at twilight. So this day shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. So the 14th day of the month. Okay, first month of the year, 14th day of the month. Okay, uh, number says the same thing. On the 14th day of this month at twilight, you shall keep it as an appointed time. And they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the first month at twilight. 14th day. 
All right, seeing a pattern here, Leviticus 23. On the 14th day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. Okay, so Passover is on the 14th. Here's the question. What day was Jesus crucified? Would it have been the 14th? Maybe the 15th? Okay, well, what year was it? Because whatever year he was crucified, that would tell you the day of the month, wouldn't it? Because Passover is a floating holiday, right? Like it, whenever it's on a specific day, it changes the day of the week. You know, like Christmas, December 25th, it's not always on the same day of the week. So we could actually look, you know, if he was crucified on a Friday, what year would that be? We could look into that. Some people have different arguments. Was it a Friday? Well, maybe he was crucified on Wednesday. That's actually a popular theory, that he was crucified on Wednesday. And so depending on what year you calculate that his crucifixion, this might actually affect when the 14th was. But I think our answer, or at least our uh, attempt at showing that the challenge is not a contradiction, can be found on, in, um, well, the second part of Leviticus 23. Because verse 6 says, okay, Passover is on the 14th. Verse 6 says, on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. So, so, so here, if you look in the Old Testament, here's the deal. Um, you have the Exodus, you have the plagues, you know, and everything, let my people go. The Passover is on the 14th. You have the angel of the Lord sweep through and, you know, kill all the firstborn. And then the very next day, because the Egyptians were throwing them out in a hurry, they grabbed up everything and they left. And the bread they had was just the dough they already had prepared. So there was no leaven. And so you have Passover, which celebrates the actual Passover of the angel. And then the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is a seven-day feast, commemorates the actual journey out of Egypt, the flight from Egypt. Okay, two separate holidays. No matter where you read in the Old Testament, you see two separate holidays. Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread. And I think we get a glimpse of where our problem is beginning in um, Mark 14. It says, Now on the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover lamb. Now hold on a second. When is the Passover lamb killed? On Passover. When's Passover? The 14th. When's unleavened bread? The 15th. Okay, somebody's confused. Because Passover is not the first day of unleavened bread. Except it is. Now, if you actually look at the way that Jews celebrate the Passover today, to today, the way Jews celebrate this is they, there's one, there's one seven day feast. They call Passover and it actually starts on the 15th. So over the centuries, the holidays morphed into something different than it was. Okay. We, um, However, wasn't always that way. If you go back to, you know, like I said, Exodus, back to the very beginning in Israel, Passover was on the 14th, Feast of Unleavened Bread on the 15th through the 21st. Today, Passover, 15th through the 21st. is the way it's celebrated. However, that wasn't always the way. It changed at some point. Josephus actually mentions that they keep a feast for eight days, and he says it is called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So even Josephus, he's first century historian, shortly after Jesus' time. So he's saying, okay, by this time, Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread had kind of already merged. And they just called it Unleavened Bread. Or some actually just called it Passover. What we have with the original Passover, the lamb was killed at the beginning of the 14th. Here's another fun thing that gets in the mix. Jews count their days from sunset to sunset. So whenever it says to kill the Passover lamb at twilight, does that mean the beginning, like sunset, beginning of the 14th, or at the end of the 14th, right before sunset turns into the 15th? Which one is it? Traditionally, it had been the 14th, okay? But now it has changed to where the lamb is killed toward the end, end of the 14th. 
um, originally the lamb was killed at home. This was not a holy day where you had to go to the temple and have a priest do something. This was a commemorative meal you had with your family at home. It was not, a re- um, it was not some kind of sacramental thing where a priest had to be involved. Now the lamb is killed at the temple. Originally, blood was sprinkled on the doorposts. Uh, by Jesus' time, blood is sprinkled on the altar. Okay. Originally, the meal was eaten on the night of the 14th. By the time of Jesus, the meal is eaten on the night of the 15th. Um, originally, the Passover commemorates the passing over, the angel passing over. By Jesus' time, it commemorates the Exodus in general. Just lump it all in together. Originally, the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were a total of eight days. By around Jesus' time, it was changing, and you had seven days of unleavened bread that was incorrectly called the Passover. What holiday did we just celebrate? Easter. Okay, so we celebrated Easter. And we'll refer to Easter, like like, like the season, the time. We'll just call it Easter. But what was Friday? Before. Good Friday. How about Thursday? Baptists don't generally observe it, but Maundy Thursday, which is a commemoration of the Last Supper. Okay, so you actually have several individual observances that all just get lumped together and called Easter. Well, by Jesus' time, that's what was happening with the Passover on the 14th, and then the unleavened bread, it was just all thrown in together, and it could alternatively be called unleavened bread or Passover. Okay? So the water is quite muddy. Are you picking up on that? Okay, here's when this happened. Historians kind of point to King Josiah. I don't know if I, um, I don't think I put all this out all the way in your notes. Um, King Josiah, where did I, where did I do it? Oh, I did. There it is. Bottom of the page. Um, 2 Kings 23 Verses 21 to 23, it says, And the king commanded all the people, saying, Keep the Passover to the Lord your God, as it is written in this book of the covenant. Such a Passover surely had never been held since the days of the judges who judged Israel, nor in all the days of the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah. But in the 18th year of King Josiah, this Passover was held before the Lord in Jerusalem. King Josiah was a reformer. He loved God. He pulled Israel kicking and screaming back into the observance of the feast and worship of God. They cleansed the temple. He tore down idols. He tore down other um, altars to false gods. And he reinstituted observances of the law. But he kind of went really hard the other way. And they took the Passover, which before that time had been an individual practice, you with your family at home. Maybe a community celebration, but it was not a temple feast. And they turned it into a temple feast. Where you come to Jerusalem and the lambs are slaughtered at the temple. That happened at King Josiah. I mean, it says right there, it had never been held since the days of the judges who judged Israel, nor in all the days of the kings. And he made an observance before the Lord in Jerusalem. They changed Passover. So, so here we historically, we see where it shifted. Um, historians actually track the kind of evolution of Passover quite a bit. <sighs> so what's the point of all this? That should not be there. All right, there we go. All right. The point is that there's a lot going on in the Gospels referring to Passover that's kind of vague. Was Passover at sundown, at the beginning of the 14th, or at sundown as the 14th turns into the 15th? Which one is it? Is it an individual practice, or it is a communal observance by the nation? Is Passover day separate from this week-long festival of unleavened bread, or is Passover day one of unleavened bread? Which is it? Then there's this thing called the Hagiga. Jewish word. It basically means, um, I forget exactly what the word literally means, but it, it's, a, it's a remembrance feast. These are, these are often associated with their um, uh, festival meals, especially pilgrimage meals, uh, or pil- pilgrimage festivals where you actually have to go into Jerusalem. 
It's not an official um, observance, but the Passover Hagiga would have been referred to as a Passover meal. Maybe some scholars have said that's what the Last Supper was. It wasn't the official Passover meal, but it was a meal that was associated with Passover. Maybe is that what it was? Or uh, what year was Jesus crucified, like I've already said? Depending on when he was crucified, it could have been anywhere from um, 30 A.D. to 34 A.D., anywhere in there. And depending on which year he was crucified, depends on where Passover falls, and so how, how does all that work out with the days of the week? That changes things as well. And then, does the day of preparation refer to preparation for Passover specifically, or was it the day of preparation for the regular Sabbath that just happened to fall during the Passover season? There are a whole bunch of question marks in there. So what's the answer? I don't know. That's my answer. I don't know if the meal that Jesus ate was specifically the official Passover or, or if it was a Hagiga or if it was some other meal that was associated with the Passover. I don't know. As, as you've seen, the water is so muddy on this issue. It could possibly be that Mark is writing and he's using terms to describe the Passover that technically are right for the way they talk that, at that time. Meanwhile, you know, the other gospel writers are writing and they're using the same kind of language. It means quite a little bit of different thing. Because there was no one specific, this is the official way it's supposed to be celebrated, nothing else allowed. There were people who did celebrate Passover in their homes that didn't go to the temple. There were people who celebrated it at sundown at the very beginning of the 14th. However, we know that the official celebration in Jerusalem, they sacrificed the lambs on the afternoon of the 14th and then celebrated the actual meal that evening, which was the 15th. Okay, I mean, there was no one set way. So, I mean, it's possible that one gospel author is referring to one thing when he says Passover, and another gospel author is referring to another thing when he says Passover. Okay, all of this is mixed in. And here's what I want to leave you with when it comes to this. Because like I said, my answer, I don't know. But it's okay to not have all the answers. It is. It's fine. Not knowing exactly how to unravel this mystery does not undermine the Bible at all. And that's really what critics and skeptics are getting at whenever they bring up these contradictions is they want to say, aha, it's an error. You can't trust that Bible. It's not the word of God. But here's what I know. If kind of the, the waters of the definitions of what's being talked about around Passover are so muddy, I can't really find an answer. Guess who else doesn't have an answer? The critic who's trying to claim that there's a contradiction. He has no more an answer than I do in order to point at a contradiction. Because he would have to be so sure and so certain and so definitively set in his definitions beyond doubt in order to prove that contradiction. But he can't. He can have some ideas, he can make a case, but ultimately, historically, the issues around the Passover and what's called what and when things happened are so kind of foggy through the you know, lens of history. I don't know. Doesn't mean that the Gospels are wrong. Just means, not really sure what they're trying to say right there. Doesn't mean Jesus didn't have a Last Supper with his disciples. Doesn't mean he wasn't crucified. Doesn't mean he didn't raise again. Just means there's some details right around there at the beginning that I'm not really sure what they're talking about. <laughs> Somebody's sundial batteries ran down. <laughs> What's that? If we knew it all, have yeah, if we knew it all, I mean, there'd be no, you know, it's like, the, and there are things where we just have to trust God. Go, Lord, I'm looking at this and uh, I'm not sure, but I don't know. Yeah. 
And, and that's another thing where, where it's like, I, I think that we need to remind ourselves, and I know I need to remind myself because I actually try to get out there and engage with skeptics and critics and non-believers who try to give challenges and stuff is, you know what? Sometimes you just need to avoid foolish and ignorant disputes knowing that they generate strife. You know, is this a contradiction? No. The case cannot be successfully made that this is a contradiction. So what's the answer? I don't know. But I'm not going to argue about it. It won't solve anything. All it will do is generate strife. But what I do know are the challenges that I can actually get to an answer. They fail every time. This one, you know what? There can be a mystery box. There can be things that we look at and we go, uh, I don't know. It's okay to not have all the answers. But based on the fact that the answers I do have continually over and over and over point to the truth of the Bible, I'm, I'm willing to say, I don't know, on this one. So, <sighs> And that wraps up this. You know, and, and I think that there's something that we need to keep in mind when it comes to these kind of issues is that these challenges come, as I said, with, for an express purpose. Okay, these aren't just trivial matters that people bring up. Whenever a non-believer, whenever a skeptic or critic of Christianity brings up a contradiction, his point or her point is that if this is an error, your Bible's wrong. Well, guess what? It's not an error. As we've seen, even on this little narrow window, not an error. And most of them, most of the things that they're going to point at and say, look at that error, look at that contradiction, are so silly that they themselves are the ones who need to be ashamed of buying into such a thing. I, I'm actually kind of, you know, as I've been going through this, um, that there have been some scholars, you know, like the one we showed and some others that I've read that, that say these things. And I'm just thinking... Uh, Come on, man, you, you of anyone should know better. You study this for a living, but yet they just say it. So matter-of-factly. Yeah, pride. They want to be the one that's right. Or it sells books. You know? I mean, if you write a book, if you write a, a top-notch scholarly academic book showing that the Bible is reliable, no one cares. You write a book full of garbage claims saying the Bible's false, you're rich overnight. That's just kind of how that goes. So, I mean, I don't, I don't want to assign um, unscrupulous motives to people I don't know. Maybe they really are just their thinking is so blinded by, you know, their sinfulness and their pride that they just really don't see it. They actually think these challenges undermine the Bible. And as I said before, because one of the things that they'll say is, look at all of this, you know, you're just knocking them down back and forth. Like you're having to dance, you know, like in the Westerns, we're like, dance, boy, you know, shooting, you know, they're having to jump around dodging bullets, right? And they act like that's what you're doing. If you're, when, as we're answering these, they're like, you're just dancing, you're just dodging bullets. I'm like, yeah, we dodged them all. The point is we didn't get shot. The point is you can't aim because these are not errors. The, the, the analogy I made before is this like a, 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 whole, a boat and they're acting like we're running around plugging leaks. No, what we're doing is we're showing there's no leak at all. And they're trying to say there's a hole. And where? There's no hole. There's no leak. That wasn't an error. The Bible continues to stand the test of time. What's interesting, and I mentioned this to Jake Sunday, um, in my research for this, I came across a rather long, long, long and boring um, treatment of this stuff by St. Augustine, which was like 400 AD. You know, he, I mean, he, he was back way, way back then, 1600 years ago. One of the smartest theologians and scholars in church history actually went through and most of these things I found he had addressed. 1,600 years ago, these things were answered. 
But yet, they're still out there. And there are still people who say, ooh, look at this contradiction. Do they, I've said this before, do they really think that in 2,000 years, they're the first person to think of that? Nope. Old news, long since proven not to be an error, and that the Bible is indeed reliable. So, <sighs> that's all I've got. Y'all got any questions? Uh, according to according to the Bible, I believe it is Numbers chapter nine. I think it is where it says the next year, the very next year they celebrate it again. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, yeah. No. It, it was. It, it started, and then that's that's how they did it. From the beginning, that's how it was. And you know, I, I'm not going to get legalistic about it. It's not a big deal that holidays and the way you celebrate holidays change. I mean, for the nation of Israel, it might be a little big deal because God said, do this on the 14th. Well, and so for them, with their, you know, that being their law for their nation, straight from God, to do it on the 15th might be, you know, disobedience. Um, but, you know, Things change and evolve a little bit over time. That's not a big deal. But, you know, kind of makes it hard to nail down what exactly they're talking about whenever there's so much give and understanding how they celebrated Passover. Yeah. Yeah, in Exodus, depending on how you date that, it was about 3,500 years ago. 36. Yeah. Yeah, that was a long time ago. Yeah, we all have to go look at that. We'll go look at that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that one's 100% right. No, I, no that, I, I've even read some things on there that I'm like, uh, don't know. That's exactly when I would put that. But you're good. All right. Well, I'm done. Y'all done? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you again, Lord. I just ask that you would help us to, to know and to understand the truth and the reliability of your word, that it stands the test of time, no matter what critics have thrown at it, it continues to show itself to be true. Help us to understand that, that we might put a priority on knowing it and living what it says. In Jesus' name, amen.